course, the most famous celestial object of all, just bar none. And uh, there's just nothing like the full moon. And uh, in lore, in legend, in science, for a lot of reasons, uh, people have always been in awe of it. And one reason is that it's perfectly round. Now, there are not a lot of perfectly round objects in nature. But the sun is one of them. When we see the sun sometimes through a little bit of fog or some thin enough clouds that we can actually see its shape, it is perfectly round. And the moon, the same thing, because uh, the moon's diameter of 2,160 miles in one direction, equatorial diameter, the polar diameter is only four miles less than that. In other words, one part in 500 out of round. And that's far less than the human eye can ever see. So when it is full, and if you ever catch the full moon within a few hours of being full, it is, and it's high enough in the sky, of course, so that it's not distorted by the thick air near the horizon, well, then you are seeing a what the eye would uh, perceive as a perfectly round object. But it's not a perfectly bright object because its reflectivity is only about 11%. In fact, some parts of the moon only reflect 8% of the light. Uh, the bright spots reflect as much as 15 And even that is dark, 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 about as dark as soil or a country road or a parking lot, a paved asphalt parking lot. So that if some crazed developer were to pave the entire moon surface, turn it into a parking lot, it actually would not get any darker than it already is. At the full moon, we maximally see the what's called albedo changes, the difference in brightness between its uh, dark, solidified lava areas called seas, or the Latin word is uh, maria, and the uh, brighter regions. And so all the blotches you see on the moon are these areas of hardened lava. The moon only had a brief period when lava was flowing shortly after its birth, which we now believe happened when an, uh, an object the size of Mars struck Earth and blew out a lot of material and sent it into space. At that early point in its evolution, it was hot enough to have volcanoes. They quickly stopped. And all we have left are these blotches that we see on the full moon. There's a lot of lore and legend attached to it. Some people think that around the full moon there are more births. Not true. If it were true, then we'd have birthdays that follow a kind of sine wave pattern. More at full moon, fewer at half moon, more at full moon like that. And that doesn't exist. All sorts of statistical surveys show that births are totally random around the lunar month and that people only perceive events happening around full moon because they're aware of the full moon, and we humans like to associate things. Some people think that crime goes up around the full moon, but it does not either. But that doesn't mean that the full moon is powerless to influence us at all. Of course, because it's then on a straight line, Earth, Sun, and Moon, at that time, the tidal forces are the greatest in the oceans on average around the world rise and fall three feet and uh, that's the maximum kind of tides and at that time uh, it contrasts with the neap tides the wishy-washy nothing tides that we see when the moon is a half either the first quarter or the last quarter uh, these are the biggest tides uh, that we get called the spring tides having nothing to do with the season of spring they're only called that because the tides kind of spring out at us at that time. We, of course, have sent people to the moon all on this side that we're seeing. None on the far side. And never make that mistake. There is no dark side of the moon. Because every part of the moon gets day and night at two-week intervals. But only now, at full moon, is the far side, the hemisphere we don't see, the back side of the moon, the same as the temporary dark side. We're seeing the side that's lit up, the daytime side, and the other side happens to be dark right now. The full moon here at SLU. I'm Bob Berman. This is SLU.
And we are now looking at the best planet in the universe so far as beauty goes. Well, according to most people, there are some who say Jupiter is more interesting because it has more features on its surface and they change hour to hour and day by day. But who can deny the beauty of Saturn and its rings? My goodness. And this is a fabulous year to be observing the planet. In uh, the constellation of Virgo, it'll be in Virgo next year as well. It is well positioned over our observatories, and this is the best time of year to be seeing it also. It reaches its closest point to Earth in April of this year. That means its largest, brightest, best seen during the months of March and April and May. That's just the optimum viewing times of this year and uh, as the color comes swarming in we can see that uh, my goodness it's gorgeous the only thing that varies is the seeing conditions if you're an old hand with a astronomy you know what seeing means it has nothing to do with the transparency it has to do with the steadiness of the image when the air over the slew observatories has the same temperature all the way up, or nearly the same temperature. It means every part of the image arrives just as it should. If the air is not homogeneous, that is, if there's a warmer layer and a colder layer, well, cold air bends light more than warm air does, and as each little part of Saturn's image travels through these disparate temperature layers, they get bent one way and then another, and the result is a bit of blurriness. So as we look at Saturn, it changes in its crispness and its sharpness only because of local conditions. And these themselves vary from night to night and hour to hour and even minute to minute. So each mission to Saturn uh, commonly looks a little different from another mission to Saturn simply because of the observing conditions. So what have we got right now when the observing conditions are perfect? Well, here are the things to look for. First and foremost, because the rings are no longer edgewise the way they were last year, the rings are tilted enough for us to uh, see them quite well now. We look for the Cassini division. That's that gap between the main rings. The uh, biggest rings are the A ring, and uh, that's the outer ring, and then the very wide and lightest colored B ring, and the space between the two, which has been swept clean by uh, gravitational resonances with uh, Saturn's moons, is that inky dark gap between them. It's very, very fine, and uh, to be able to see it, that's the first sign that we have good conditions tonight. There is even a almost transparent C ring, and we only see that where it passes in front of the planet. So look at the rings, where they cross Saturn's body itself, and you'll see a, a darkening at that section. That's the interesting C ring. Also look for a shadow of uh, Saturn on the rings themselves. In the uh, weeks leading up to its opposition, you'll see that the geometry of the Earth and the Sun and Saturn cause Saturn to cast shadow on the right side of the rings, where the rings go behind the planet. And after April, starting in late April and then continuing for the rest of this year, you'll see the dark uh, shadow being cast on the left side of Saturn's body onto the rings. So all these things change. We'll also look for little storms. Saturn, of course, doesn't have all the fascinating endless detail that Jupiter does because uh, Jupiter's stuff is right at the cloud tops, and Saturn, even though it's covered with clouds, uh, it's more subtle. But nonetheless, you'll see changes on the body itself. Look for the light band around the equator and the darkening around the polar regions. Also, Look at how Saturn is not round. It's squashed. That's because Saturn only weighs seven-tenths of what water does. It's lighter than water. So if we could find an ocean large enough, Saturn would float like a cork. And uh, this makes Saturn's uh, big 10-hour rotation makes it a little bit squashed. Fascinating world. This is SLU, and I'm Bob Berman.